Thanks everyone for joining today's Space Syntax Lab seminar. We are really excited to welcome Ruth Nelson to talk about her work on housing inequalities. Uh, Ruth is an interdisciplinary PhD researcher in the Center for Urban Science and Policy at the TU Delft in the Netherlands. She has worked in corporate consulting and research roles in South Africa, the UK, Mexico, Australia, and the Netherlands which has given her a diverse perspective on a range of important global issues, such as urban inequalities and social inclusion. Ruth has both an MSc in architecture and space syntax. And in her work, she aims to support the development of more equitable policies and design solutions by harnessing the power of digital technologies and spatial data science through both consulting and research. And before I hand over to Ruth, we will have a Q&A at the very end. So if you have any question, please put them in the chat. The Q&A is moderated by Demon Hu. So welcome to you, Demon. And with this, I'd like to hand over to you, Ruth. I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here today. It's wonderful to be back with the Space and Tax Lab. Um, as Kimon said, I did my MRES in the Space and Tax Lab in 2018, um, and it really uh, informed a lot of my thinking in terms of systems thinking, uh, relational thinking, evidence-based design. Um, so yes, it's wonderful to be back with this community. Um, I am in the third year of my PhD at TU Delft. Um, the way it works in the Netherlands is it's a paper-based PhD. And this is the, the second paper of my PhD. Um, the overarching theme of my PhD is urban inequalities, but this paper specifically focuses on housing inequalities. So the title, as you know, is Housing Inequalities, the Space-Time Geography of Housing Policies. Uh, there we go. Um, so wealth inequalities are on the rise globally. The share of the bottom 50% of the world's population's total global wealth is 2%, while the share of the top 10% is 76%. So you can see that there are big differences there. A large portion of wealth accumulation in the 20th and 21st century really can be attributed to capital gains through housing. So housing is a contributory factor to this. In Western societies, there's been an increasing policy preference for home ownership. It's, uh, it's very much a goal to achieve, right? Um, something that's been encouraged, something that you can pass on to your children. It's capital, which you can draw on. Um, it's a safety net, especially in old age once you've retired. Unfortunately, however, aspirations in home ownership have been affected, right? They've been affected by high price, price inflation, periods of economic recession. And this has led to terms such as uh, generation rent, uh, which refers to a generation of younger people who are really finding it difficult to enter uh, the housing market. Um, and, and this is leading to differences uh, between people who don't own a home, people who own a home, or people who own multiple homes. And this could also refer to businesses and corporations and organizations who have brought up homes for profit. So in this paper, the way that uh, we sort of look at housing inequalities is really differences in levels of home ownership, differences in capital gains over time, as well as where housing is placed within the greater urban system. What kind of location is housing within? What kind of amenities are locally available within a local neighborhood? Um, and how does this actually affect uh, housing inequalities over time? So when we looked at the literature, we found that housing inequalities are generally either conceptualized as an outcome of macroeconomic policy or alternatively as a product of local social spatial conditions through the lens of neighborhood change. So macroeconomic policy, obviously referring to large sort of structural policy and institutional changes and uh, at the neighborhood level, rather referring to the micro sort of place and time. Um, so 
literature from a macroeconomic policy perspective, as I said, tends to focus on profound structural changes, particularly the structural changes which were implemented in the 1980s in advanced economy banking systems, where the state sort of started to give less sort of welfare and social support. Um, and this would sort of be, the idea was this would be offset by assets, by encouraging people to enter the housing market and, and, and they could use a house to fall back on as opposed to direct support from the state. But what this has really led to is a series of structural sort of changes in policy processes, um, such as the deregulation of the housing market, the financialization of the housing market, which of course refers to profit making through housing, as well as the globalization of housing. Um, of course, housing has a very local sort of geography, but it very much forms part now of the global economy. Um, and I think the 2008 financial crisis really demonstrates this with the, with the crash of the housing market. And then alternatively, housing inequalities are also being conceived within a framework of neighborhood development over time. So looking at how neighborhoods change and develop and how this might affect uh, housing inequalities. Um, and researchers from this perspective tend to focus on sort of more local characteristics, such as access to transportation, educational facilities in neighborhoods, local amenities, local access to employment opportunities, and how over time this might actually contribute uh, to housing inequalities. So in this paper, um, what we sort of focus on and attempt to do is connect and contextualize institutional structural shifts in housing policy with social spatial trends and trajectories of neighborhood development using Rotterdam in the Netherlands as a case, a case study. So marrying these two sort of approaches together. So the case okay. study that we utilized is Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, so the Netherlands is a very interesting case because comparatively, it actually has quite low levels of income inequality, but it's showing quite high levels of wealth inequality. And as we know, uh, wealth is very much linked to uh, housing wealth. Um, so in that sense, it made sense uh, to utilize the Netherlands as a case. Um, and Rotterdam, it's a secondary city. It's not a, a global city like London or New York or Mexico City. Um, so this research, I think, also contributes towards uh, kind of understanding uh, secondary cities. But it's still a very important city in the Netherlands. It's the second largest city. Uh, it has the largest port in Europe and it's very diverse. It's actually been labeled as a hyper diverse city. Um, specifically during the 20th century, it attracted a range of migrants after World War II to rebuild the city, to rebuild the port. Uh, at a national level, they encouraged a lot of migrants from Turkey and Morocco, Morocco former colonies of the Netherlands, um, so it's also an interesting case from that perspective. So I'm now going to uh, move on to uh, the methodology. And there's three uh, sort of parts to this methodology. The first is an analysis of housing policies. Um, so to do this, we constructed a timeline of policies uh, from 1945 to 2018. And through this multi-scalar timeline, we essentially were able to identify various policy phases. And in those phases, we mapped various institutional relationships and how those relationships changed over time. And from that, we were able to basically solidify these particular policy trends over this time period in relation to housing. Then the second part, um, of the methodology uh, involved a geospatial, spatial temporal analysis. Um, we looked at Rotterdam specifically um, and neighborhoods within Rotterdam uh, over the time period of 1999 to 2018. Of course, we didn't have as much data <laughs> as we had with the timeline of policies. Uh, this is a, a bit of a limitation. Um, 
but we still felt it was important to extend the timeline of policies beyond that for a uh, purpose of context. So in terms of the neighborhoods, we selected a number of different variables across economic, urban, and demographic dimensions and looked at this over time um, and we compared each year. We had to obviously account uh, for inflation with the economic variables. We then normalized the variables so that we could utilize a dimension reducing technique, uh, K-means clustering, to essentially identify categories of neighborhoods over time for every single year. And this enabled us, of course, to identify these typologies of neighborhoods and we used a cluster evaluation technique to ensure that we had the optimal number of categories. And then we did something called sequencing analysis, which was actually a technique that was developed originally in uh, biology for DNA to look at how DNA transforms over time. Um, and then it was adopted by life sciences. And now it's actually being used quite frequently to analyze trajectories of neighborhood change. So it allowed us to essentially develop these trajectories of how neighborhoods changed between these categories over time. And then again, we clustered the sequences to essentially get categories of trajectories um, and use the cluster evaluation technique to ensure that we had the optimal number. And that essentially gave us the geospatial trends. And the final part was uh, sort of relating these two trends uh, to each other, a comparative sort of analysis, utilizing key variables related to housing. So just to briefly reflect on some of the limitations, of course, the analysis of historical housing policy is able to adopt a much wider time scale than the spatial temporal analysis. We, uh, yeah, we recognize that um, and then Further limitations are imposed on the spatial temporal analysis in relation to the availability of data. So some data wasn't available in 1999, it was available in 2018, we just had to leave those variables out. And of course, we very much focus on the neighborhood scale and there's always issues around this, uh, the neighborhood and the, the exact boundary. And we had to use that administrative boundary because that's what the data was linked to. But also when you're thinking about policy and particularly in Rotterdam where some policies are imposed on those administrative boundaries. It actually made sense in this, in this study to use the administrative boundaries. Of course, it's secondary data that we utilize. We cannot confirm that it's 100% accurate. So for example, we, use, we, we look at non-native Dutch residents and native Dutch residents, someone might identify as native Dutch, be, but be labeled as non-native Dutch. And interestingly, in the Netherlands, even if you were born here and you speak Dutch and, and, and everything, if you just have one foreign parent, you are labeled as non-native non Dutch. And that can happen for a couple of gener generations. So you can have still second, third generation people who are labeled as non-native Dutch, even if they've been, they've lived here and, and their parents have. So I, um, I'm going to move on to the results now. I'll begin with the analysis of housing policies. Uh, so this is our sort of multi-scalar timeline. Uh, we mapped different policies uh, and different kind of large events uh, at different scales, global, national, local. And we also looked at the political situation in Rotterdam because that ac actually affected some, some of the policies. I'm not gonna go through each one, um, but we had the three phases we sort of identified were highly regulated housing in the Netherlands with an emphasis on social housing, um, a significant decrease in regulation in housing in the Netherlands with an emphasis on now on home ownership. And then the third phase being an increase in regulation in the Netherlands with still an emphasis on home ownership. So I'll dive into, into these three phases in a little bit more detail now. Um, so from 1945 to 1989, roughly, you have the highly regulated housing with an emphasis on social housing. So housing very much during this time um, was part of the welfare state agenda, right? Where there was a high level of government involvement in the delivery of infrastructure and particularly in the delivery of housing. Um, housing associations who governed social housing were directly govern governed by the national and local government. Um, they were financed directly by the national and local government. So there was a separation very much between the private and the public sector 
yeah. And the social sector grew during that time. It grew tremendously. It's even been referred to as sort of the golden age for social housing uh, in Europe and, and the Netherlands. And locally in Rotterdam, we see that the local goals aligned with the national goals. There was a lot of effort to just rebuild the port, rebuild the city. There was a lot of encouraging of sort of foreign migrants to come in and help with these efforts. Then uh, from sort of roughly 1990 to 2008, we see massive sort of decrease in regulation around housing, now with an emphasis on home ownership. And this very much follows the kind of broader neoliberal agenda, which aimed to sort of release the heavy financial burden of public housing and stimulate increased levels of individual home ownership. And what we see now is that the housing associations were privatized um, and they now get their financing directly from the bank. Social housing is still available for low income and middle income tenants. And you know, they inherited a lot of real estate and the housing associations really use this, this real estate as collateral for new investments. And locally in Rotterdam, we see the rise of, of Livable Rotterdam, which was a political party, which really centered itself on divisive issues of multiculturalism and integration. And they implemented the controversial Rotterdam law, which uh, I'm not sure if you know about, but essentially what it did is certain neighborhoods, which they labeled as um, not doing so well, not being so prosperous. They said this law is still in place today, actually, that people under a certain income threshold are no longer allowed to move into those neighborhoods. This is quite a controversial law because lower income can also sort of be seen as a proxy for sort of non-native Dutch uh, residents. And then the final phase is an increase in regulation, still with an emphasis on home ownership. So what we see is in the Netherlands, there was now an after 2008, after the global economic crash, um, an increase in regulation uh, to restrict the growth of, of the housing associations. Essentially, um, the housing associations had to be bailed out after 2008. It cost the government millions and they wanted to restrict the growth. No longer were middle income tenants allowed to get social housing. They were pushed to the private sector um, and the housing associations now have a tax which they had to pay, um, which really restricted uh, their got growth as well as their ability to build. Um, and really both nationally and locally in Rotterdam, there's a political narrative that exists that there is excess social housing. But what we're seeing in the Netherlands now is that there is a housing crisis. The market is being squeezed. Obviously the middle income tenants have now moved to the private sector. There's less social housing before when there were market downturns, the government could come in and, and kind of uh, incentivize uh, more building of social housing. And also global investors have entered, entered the market, meaning that local individuals now have to compete with these, these large firms. So I'm going to move on to the geospatial analysis, which focuses on the, the trajectories of neighborhood change in Rotterdam. So as I said, we incorporated a number of dimensions and variables from demographic, economic, and urban dimensions. The demographic variables focused on things like the total population, percentage of native Dutch, non-native Dutch, age groups, economic variables focused on mean income, mean house value being quite important, percentage of owned versus rental units being quite important. And then from the urban side, uh, land use, local amenities, access to transportation, as well as mean integration centrality and mean betweenness centrality. Uh, so from there, we went on to cluster the neighborhoods over the time period to essentially identify uh, various categories. And we found that there were four sort of predominant categories. So the first is affluent native Dutch neighborhoods. We refer, we refer to as affluent native Dutch neighborhoods. The second is native Dutch neighborhoods. The third is diverse young sort of professional neighborhoods. And the, and the fourth being non-native Dutch neighborhoods. And already from these visuals, you can start to see sort of visual differences, I think, uh, in, in these neighborhoods. There were a lot of differences, so I'm not going to <laughs> go through all of the differences in detail. Uh, I will focus on a couple of variables uh, in the next slide, which I think are important to highlight. Uh, 
So these are box plots plotting uh, different variables. The affluent Dutch neighborhoods are in red. And essentially we find in these neighborhoods that there's a high percentage of native Dutch residents. They have the highest income, highest percentage of owned homes, um, houses of the most value. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the non-native Dutch neighborhoods, which um, have very low, lower percentages of native Dutch populations, lower income, the lowest incomes, actually the lowest percentage of owned homes and the lowest house values. And then in between, you have the native Dutch neighborhoods, which have a high percentage of native Dutch, lower income, lower percentages of owned homes and house values, and then the diverse young professionals who are sort of a mix between native and non-native Dutch, uh, higher incomes, but lower incomes than the affluent Dutch, um, higher ownership than, than the rest, but lower than the affluent Dutch. And the same thing with the house values, higher than the rest, but lower than the, than the affluent Dutch. So what we did then is we went and put this into the, the, the sequencing, um, and we did the sequencing analysis to essentially identify the trajectories. And we uh, uh, classified these trajectories, which led to nine categories. And what we immediately see is actually a lot of the neighborhoods were stable in terms of their trajectories. Once they were in one category, they stayed in that category. Um, and an interesting finding when looking at the transition rates is that we find that once a neighborhood was affluent Dutch, it tended to stay affluent Dutch. Once it was non-native Dutch, it tended to stay non-native Dutch. But if it was a diverse young professional, it could transform to non-native. Same with the less affluent Dutch, and this was actually the most transformations we saw. And only the less affluent Dutch transformed to affluent Dutch over time. So what we see is a bit of a polarization between non-native Dutch neighborhoods and affluent Dutch uh, neighborhoods. And when we look also at sort of the spatial, sort of uh, these are the neighborhoods in Rotterdam and you've got the river and the ring road. When we look at sort of the spatial configuration and where the neighborhoods actually lie, we start to see that over time, there's a division between the North and the South. So that's in 1999 and we go on till 2018. And the, the affluent Dutch is in dark red and the non-native Dutch is in sort of aqua. And you can see how the South sort of becomes more non-native Dutch over time below the river, then above the ring road at the top becomes sort of more affluent Dutch over time. So we also see sort of a spatial concentration and location of, of these neighborhoods coming into play. So now we're going to look at the comparative trends focusing on trying to sort of relate the policy trends to the geospatial trends using key variables related to housing. So we looked at uh, medium, I'm battling to see my titles there uh, with the Zoom, but we looked at medium uh, ownership percentage level uh, by sequence. We also looked at the median ratio income to house value by sequence, the median mean house value by sequence. Let me just see if I can move this quickly so I can. Um, oh, well, well, we'll just continue with that. I can't, I can't see the titles. It's fine. Um, so when we look at the median percentage um, of home ownership, we, we see that um, all of it has really increased over time across all of them, but really the affluent, um, the affluent native Dutch neighborhoods and the one that became affluent, which is an orange, um, has really remained having the highest levels over time. So the policy of encouraging home ownership does seem to have worked, but there are certain neighborhoods which have really benefited and continue to benefit more than, than others. And then when you look at social housing um, and those levels across the neighborhoods, they've also, across the sequences, they've also gone down over time. But again, there's a big difference. Uh, the top is sort of the, the less wealthy neighborhoods and the bottom, the more wealthy neighborhoods. And there's obviously a difference there. And the, the most loss in, in decrease in, of social housing has really happened in, in the trajectory, which has gone from native Dutch to, to affluent Dutch over time. 
Then we look at the medium ratio of income to house value by sequence. Um, and you can see how in 2008, leading up to, to 2008, that ratio was quite large and then sort of drops over time. So you can see the sort of the effects of that global event locally. But again, the hierarchies of the neighborhoods haven't actually changed significantly. They might have all kind of gone up and down, but you don't see a, a changing. And then we look at the median mean house value by sequence. And again, they, they've all sort of increased and we um, we did account for inflation. Um, so they've all increased sort of in time, but some neighborhoods seem to, again, the more affluent ones have seemed to benefit, have seemed to have benefited more um, over time, and, and you can really see those gaps. So I'll now move on to the discussion where we reflect on three insights. So I think the first thing is that housing inequalities are, are multi-scalar. There's obviously been increases in levels of home ownership uh, across the trajectories, all of them, and, and all housing has gained real value. But when we look at the neighborhood scales, when we break that down, there has been an increase in non-native Dutch neighborhoods over time, and they have the highest percentage of rental units. And the affluent native Dutch neighborhoods have had the largest capital gains um, over time. So I think it's interesting because if statistically we just looked at the city, we'd say, oh, there's been an increase in home ownership. But when we break it down, um, we can start to see exactly where and, and who might, might have benefited more. I think the second thing uh, that's interesting is spatial polarization and concentrations of disadvantage. So the bank has risen as a major player. I mean, we saw that in the diagrams, how it shifted over time. Um, and the housing market has become obviously more market driven and there seems to have been an increase in the spatial polarization with the South and the North. Um, and also once a neighborhood is categorized as non-native and Dutch and affl or affluent in Dutch, it's unlikely sort of to transition. So there's again, like, sort of a polarization there. And then I also just wanted to mention that in terms of the Rotterdam law, all of the neighborhoods, which that law has been imposed on are non-native Dutch and they haven't actually changed over time. Um, I don't know if that's because there's stigma around those neighborhoods um, or just generally if a, a, a policy of social exclusion just doesn't work in terms of um, uplifting a neighborhood. Um, but that was an interesting, interesting thing to note. And then the third thing is spatial temporal analysis and policy making. I think policy analysis provides insights into sort of the systemic policy landscape in relation to housing inequalities, whereas the geospatial analysis provides into sort of insight into sort of more local social mobility of neighborhoods in Rotterdam and distributions of home ownership and capital gains. And even though there were sort of these large sort of structural shifts, that hierarchy in terms of the sequences doesn't really change, even if they all go up and down. Um, so I'll just focus on three things uh, in the conclusion. I think the first thing is uh, sort of the role of path dependency, right? Where sort of past events sort of matter and sort of constrain future events. And this does seem to be the case um, when we look at these neighborhood trajectories, kind of what they, be, the kind of, uh, category that they began with does seem to have an influence on future outcomes, particularly in this context. The second kind of insight is the demographic composition of a neighborhood. In this context, it does seem to be a factor which is related to housing inequalities. And the third factor is just commenting on the weakness of a national approach to, to housing policy. Um, and this is because while they ca housing policy tends to be enacted at a national level and there tends to be sort of a blanket sort of approach, but it, this doesn't really take into account scale or different local conditions uh, within a city. And I think that that is something um, that needs to be thought about more. So 
really some of the concluding remarks being that I think there's, we think that there's potential for geospatial analysis to provide decision-making support for real world phenomena, such as housing inequalities, right? It, it doesn't necessarily give you direct answers, but I think it's useful for increasing understanding. Um, and geospatial analysis provides critical reflection on policies. In this study, it highlights who and where have benefited the most. And I think this is often sort of hidden within uh, sort of national statistics, right? Oh, home ownership has increased or uh, house prices have grown, but it, those statistics hide where and who um, have really benefited. And yeah, we suggest that housing policies need to consider adopting a multi-scalar approach. Geography cannot be divorced from housing policies and neither should housing policies be divorced from place and time. Um, so yeah, that's basically uh, the end of my presentation. Um, thank you so much. I, I'm happy to share that this paper has recently been published in Cities uh, Open Access uh, for everyone everyone to read. So um, yes, thank you. And thank you to my co-authors and supervisors, Dr. Trivik Verma and Prof. Martin Vonier. And if you would like to connect or chat further, please, please link with me on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, ResearchGate. Thank you very much.